Well, in this first session, we will begin with the book of Hebrews. And uh, between today and tomorrow, uh, we will be completely done. So um, appreciate all the journals and uh, your uploaded work that has been done so far. As for Hebrews, it is generally accepted that the book of Hebrews was written primarily to Jewish believers residing in Rome. Addressing the Jews at Rome is, is primarily uh, evident because of the Jewish tone, uh, the intense knowledge of the Old Testament and the sacrificial systems as such. So a mixed Jewish Gentile audience has been ruled out by various scholars. But having said that, we can't be certain of the dating of the book, uh, as in addition to other things, uh, you know, who wrote it. Uh, we can conclude that it was written prior to the destruction of the Herodian Temple in Jerusalem, AD 70, uh, because Hebrews does not mention this event. Moreover, given the absence of mentioning Nero's regime uh, in exterminating Christians throughout Rome, the Roman Empire, which occurred in AD 64, remember Nero, the madman, uh, this letter to the Hebrews probably dates around the early mid 60s. The author does not name name himself, and so you have various views going around, uh, and and that's interesting. You know, read up about that. Read read about the arguments for and against this author and that author. Some have speculated that Paul wrote it. However, numerous church fathers rejected Pauline authorship, including Origen and Jerome. Uh, Tertullian uh, Tertullian suggested that perhaps Barnabas uh, from the island of Cyprus penned this letter. Yet the evidence suggests that this letter having its origin in Alexandria, uh, Egypt, and not of Cyprus, or in uh, at the island of Cyprus, if you will. Moreover, authors such as Apollos, an, uh, an Alexandrian Jew, who was quote-unquote mighty in the scriptures, he's also been suggested. Um, uh, Martin Luther, he proposed perhaps Apollos. Um, interestingly, a few modern scholars have also suggested that maybe Priscilla, authored the letter. Uh, given her name uh, appearing before Aquila in the book of Acts, the fact that she taught Apollos, uh, she was also stationed in Rome prior to AD 49 when Claudius expelled the Jews from the city. We mentioned that in the book of Romans. Um, however, the, the personal pronoun used in Hebrews 11.32, 11 is masculine, suggesting a male authored the book. Nonetheless, the letter to the Hebrews is a profound work uh, with its Old Testament, historical, you know, mosaic law, sacrificial way of a system. It is also strong, very strong in Christology. High, we call that a high Christology. There's a high Christological theme to Hebrews. Its teachings on the reasons and extent of the atonement fulfilled in Jesus the Messiah is most powerful, especially in light of the Old Testament sacrificial systems, etc. requirements. Um, it's also rich in explaining how Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled general prophetic announcements in the Old Testament, such as in Messiah, all the promises of God are fulfilled all the while stressing the superiority of both Jesus' messianic priesthood and his own sacrifice. Jesus being the mediator between the Father and man is clear, which echoes the same truth we have in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Finally, Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament uh, system in his death on the cross. Remember, he, didn't, he said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. Not destroy it, but to fulfill it. Thus, by placing one's faith in the finished sacrificial death of Christ, salvation is thereby granted. It is also in Hebrews where we see the infamous Hall of Faith passage. You have that in chapter 11. Illustrating the importance and timelessness of salvation through faith, not of works. Finally, the literal and physical resurrection of Jesus is taken as a real historical event. Thus, following the ascension moment of Christ, a gospel truth, Messiah is now seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. So, due to the clear tone of these points, um, some are of the conclusion 
that that this book may have been written in the form of multiple sermons stressing and reminding its Jewish audience to remain steadfast in the finished work of Messiah and not to return to ancient Judaism since Jesus fulfilled these promises forespoken of by the Hebrew prophets in the Old Testament. So in understanding that Jesus is our high priest, you know, we can approach the throne with boldness, you know, sort of knocking down heaven's door to get the attention of the Father. This Jesus, our high priest, in the order of Melchizedek, was also tempted as we are, yet he did not give in to any sin because he was sinless. So <clears throat> it seems that this priestly figure was uh, a necessary picture for these Hebrews to fully understand. Um, thus the Jewish tone again. Since Messiah has paid with his own blood and entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption for man. Um, as far as the book of James, one of my favorite short little books, <clears throat> Unlike Paul's letters, the name of this letter is, of course, James, uh, rather than uh, addressed to uh, an audience, if you will. It's addressed James. The author is listed in word, verse 1 of chapter 1 and, and is the first word of the letter, James. However, which James is it? You know, James is a common name, and there are several men named James in the New Testament. You have James, the son of Zebedee and brother of John. James, the son of Alphaeus. James, the father of a disciple named Judas. You have that in Luke 6.16. 6, and James, the brother of Jesus. James, the son of Zebedee, is thought to have died too early to write the letter. There's no tradition assigning any authorship to James, the son of Alphaeus, either. This leaves the most likely candidate to be James, the brother of the Lord, the half-brother of Christ. Indeed, the earliest tradition assigned authorship to him. Also, the style and teaching in James is strikingly similar to Jesus' teachings, indicating someone who was intimately familiar with him, and so on. Authorship by James, the brother of Jesus, was not challenged, of course, until the 19th century, when uh, modern scholars the, of the liberal slant uh, began to have their party or heyday with the scriptures in the 19th century. He got that out of Germany and eventually made his way to the States. Um, and even today, some liberals are, liberal scholars still argue that the letter was uh, uh, written in the first or maybe early second century, uh, but their arguments rest on assumptions such as the the letter's use of, quote-unquote, good Greek style, you know, Koine Greek, um, which, which therefore would, meant, would have meant that, G, that James couldn't have written it. Uh, he's, him being a Galilean Jew, how could he write in Greek? But this argument has lost its persuasiveness lately because new research has showed uh, that Greek was just wide, widespread, you know, uh, throughout the Near East, in particular, Galilee, right? So James may have used uh, also, you know, a, a secretary who was trained in Greek. Um, that's another possibility. Critics also point to the letter's reliance of Pauline theology in a late attestation, therefore, um, that the letter relies on Paul for its theology. I'm not thoroughly convinced by that. Um, since many have seen, you know, the, the, the two apostles in opposition, you know, throughout. So the late acceptance of James is a bigger issue. The letter was not universally accepted until A.D. 397. This does not mean it didn't have any acceptance whatsoever. It did. Powerful church figures such as Gregory um, of Nazanzus, uh, Athanasius and Augustine accepted it. Um, it was also adopted in the East before the Council of 397 that officially accepted it. Uh, there's also evidence that early figures such as the shepherd of Hermas, um, who may have known James, alluded to James uh, while not directly quoting it, but there's some allusions there. Um, while late acceptance certainly doesn't help the argument of 
of, of, of Jacob's authorship, Jacobian authorship, they call it. It does not overturn it, so keep that in mind. There's nothing in James that indicate, indicates when it was written. However, based on some external evidence, the date of the letter can be assigned with a fair degree of certainty. Most scholars fall within the range of AD 44 to about 62. So, you know, some 18 years there. James became the leader of the Jerusalem church in, in 44, and Josephus assigns the martyrdom of James in 62. That's where you have 44 through 62. So, head of the Jerusalem church in 44, Josephus says James was martyred in 62, allowing time for Christianity, therefore, to become firmly established outside of the Holy Land. James was probably then written between 46 and 52. That's safe to say because it spread. The letter did. Now the audience, James does not specifically identify who he's writing to. In verse 1, he addresses the letter to the 12 tribes which have been scattered abroad. This suggests that James' audience was Jewish, um, Jewish Christians living outside of Israel. A few have suggested that the letter was meant for Jewish converts maybe living in Antioch, uh, perhaps as a follow-up letter uh, James and the other elders of the Jerusalem church sent to the churches there um, after the council of uh, the council at Jerusalem or council of Jerusalem um, based on the conclusions that they drew from that council but the letter seems too general for this uh, according to many um, a more likely answer is that James meant the letter to be you know circular let it go around being sent from one congregation to the next. James seems to allude to both wealthy and poor within the audience. Now you could say the same thing about Jewish believers. Maybe they were just, you know, a, a mixed bunch of rich and poor being scattered outside of Israel territory, if you will. But the message and occasion, that's what's important. The message of James is how to deal with external and internal trials and tribulation. Um, living out the Christian faith, so to speak. Some, like Martin Luther, for example, have seen James to be promoting salvation through works. However, a careful study of James's argument reveals that he is saying a genuine saving faith is proven, or better demonstrated, by the works it produces. So good works follow the faith commitment. It's not that faith saves. He also addresses social justice, not condemning uh, wealth, uh, but urging the, the, the wealthy to be generous uh, and that the Christians should show no partiality based on economic status. Uh, since the audience is general, um, there is no specific reason or occasion in the letter to say otherwise. Uh, it may be surmised, though, from the message that Jewish Christians everywhere were experiencing trials, and I, I would go with that. Uh, you know, followers of the way were not a popular group of people, to say the least. Uh, <clears throat> in most of the places where the gospel was preached and large numbers of Jews believed, of course you would have a lot of conflict that would follow. Um, in some places, prominent Jewish leaders felt threatened by the way, you know, here comes these Christians, you know, I got to protect my synagogue. So you had a lot of strife going there as well. Other places, converts to faith in Jesus, you know, they were put out of the synagogue and shunned from the entire Jewish community, resulting in the loss of economic opportunity. Try to find a job now, right? Uh, internally, people always seem to find ways to disagree over something. So James, of course, addresses a lot of these issues, um, including uh, conflict resulting from showing favoritism, partiality, and so forth, lack of self-control, and of course, loose talk. You can bless God on one side of the mouth and curse man on the other. Uh, that is because even the worst pagan of all pagans has the image of God upon him. So we can't do so. Uh, God doesn't take that lightly. Now, because James addresses the faith versus works question, uh, many have seen James dealing with a uh, perversion. They argue that uh, he's sort of perverting Paul's message of salvation by faith and not works. Uh, perhaps some were arguing that because salvation cannot be earned by works, works were not important. 
but works are important. So James chastises those who claim faith but ignore the need of their brothers and sisters. There's got to be a balance there. Nowhere does Paul say that, that works saves. And so therefore, you know, it's speculated. Maybe there were believers running around saying, don't matter what we do, you know, forget the poor, forget this. I'm just going to do my own thing, and that's selfish. And thus he says, look, I'll prove my faith by my works, right? Um, key information in James, you have chapter 1, uh, verse 2 through 4. My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfe perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That is definitely a great verse to remember if you're counseling somebody. Uh, biblical counseling, one of the key verses is right there. Uh, 1 verse 19, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. There you go, anger management. Chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. What is it profit, my brothers, if someone says that he has faith, but does not have works. Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warm, be filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what is it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, it's dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have my works, right? Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. There we have it. Chapter 4, 7 and, uh, 7 and 8 says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, your, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Strong words, strong words, chastisement for sure. Chapter 5, 13 through 16. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Something to consider when we head to the hospital, right? Maybe we should also make a pit stop by the church and have them pray for us. We'll have a pastor meet us at the church, anoint us with oil, just like James says. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Um, then you can uh, look up on your own. There's mainly three key people. You have Abraham, chapter 2, uh, Rahab, 2.25, and of course, Elijah in chapter 15. As far as uh, important theology, uh, throughout the book of James, you have the God's immutability, the fact that he doesn't change. You have the deity of Jesus, number two, and three, salvation produces works. True salvation, genuine, genuine uh, commitment to Christ should definitely produce good works. Now concerning God's unchanging nature or immutability, James says there is no variation or shadow of turning with God. That's in 1 verse 17. Concerning the deity or the divine nature of Jesus, James alludes to Jesus' deity calling him the Lord of glory. You have that in chapter 2 verse 1. Salvation produces works. Again, James says Faith without works is dead. He's not saying that works produces salvation. Uh, rather, just the opposite. Faith that leads to salvation should produce works. It just ought to be that way. For James, if someone claims to have faith, yet does, doesn't do anything worthy uh, of that faith uh, by means of works, is not a real saving faith. So, we are sort of not just fruit inspectors. You can be an inspector inspecting the work of fellow believers. You know, we can't be selfish. Um, get out there, you know. Feed the homeless. Start a homeless ministry. Uh, start teaching at, uh, at the rescue missions if you have no group that you're plugged into where there's maybe teaching opportunities. 
Um, there's all sorts of things we can do. Just being a nice neighbor, you know. Go street witnessing. Fruit. Um, if someone's hurting, you know, help them. If someone is sad, you know, pray with them. Uh, make them laugh. Be an encouragement. Be an ex exhorter to them. Uh, there's so many things that we can do in addition to what we already are doing. But uh, that wraps up Hebrews and James. Next, we will do First and Second Peter. And uh, you're going to get these uh, starting tonight and uh, into tomorrow, uh, ending with the book of Revelation. Um, you don't have to take, I mean, by all means, take notes for yourselves. But you don't have to upload these notes on Populi since we wrap up the semester on Sunday. All right? So I think that's, that's the, the, the date, the 15th. Anyways, uh, we'll see you soon. Lord bless.